On the surface, Arthurian legends appear to be entertaining stories about knights and chivalry, but they have their roots in a much more ancient tradition of Celtic myth. I've always been fascinated by Arthurian tales, particularly their Welsh origins, and I'm going to show you some of the more intriguing aspects of this myth, as it evolved from Welsh legend to European romance. As far as we know, there was, once upon a time, a real man called Arthur, an early Welsh leader who defended Celtic Britain against Saxon invaders sometime around the early 6th century. There are Latin histories from the 9th and 10th centuries that mention him and some of his battles, but we don't really know any more than that. Over the last half century in particular, there have been many claims about who this historical Arthur really was, but all of that has mainly been guesswork without any more real evidence. In my opinion, the historical Arthur, if there ever was such a man, is a bit of a red herring. It's not why I find him interesting. For me, the most important thing we can say about Arthur is that he is a mythic figure, and the mythology he belongs to begins in Welsh culture, where Arthur is a character immensely rich in symbolic meaning, and not only an embodiment of the heroic ideal, but part of a mystical tradition of poems and stories that express the spiritual beliefs of the British Celtic elite. Unfortunately, this older Arthur has long been overshadowed, initially by the obsession with the chivalric Arthur that developed outside of Wales, and then more recently the fanatical search for the historical Arthur. These subjects can be interesting in their own right, no doubt, but they rarely ask the important questions. How did a little-known historical figure become the centrepiece of an elaborate and profound mythology that's as popular today as it ever was? What does this older Arthur embody? What ancient Celtic beliefs are preserved in this myth? Beyond the very brief allusions to the historical Arthur in Latin texts, we find the earliest mentions of him in Welsh poetry and prose written about a thousand years ago. In these Welsh texts, Arthur is very much a mythical warrior, firmly rooted in the culture of the early Welsh nobility. Take, for example, the collection of ancient Welsh poetry known as the Gododin, attributed to the 6th century poet Aneirin, but almost certainly containing poetry from the following centuries. While not primarily about Arthur, the Gododin does contain one tantalising reference to him, and while this single mention may not be as old as the 6th century, it could easily be as old as the 9th. In an elegy for a fallen warrior, we find the following lines. Gochone brain di ar vir caer, kini baie of Arthur. He fed black ravens on the fortress wall, though he was no Arthur. The man commemorated in this poem, the one that fed black ravens, that is, he slew many enemies, performed a deed of great heroism, even though he wasn't Arthur. This suggests that at least 1,200 years ago, Arthur was already a figure of legendary prowess, a benchmark against which other warriors were measured. But what does this tell us about the myth of Arthur at this time? What type of mythical figure are we looking at here? Well, we may be able to find an answer by looking at what else the Gododin poems tell us about the warrior culture of the early Welsh. The Gododin is one of the oldest surviving works of Welsh literature, and it commemorates a war band of young men who all died in one final heroic attack against their enemies. The heroism of the Gododin is raw and visceral and deeply rooted in the values of British Celtic society. The men it depicts are not the polite, chivalric knights of later medieval romances, but fierce and bloodied warriors who revel in battle, seeking glory and renown. Yet despite their heroism, the warriors of the Gododin were ultimately doomed. 
These poems are intensely tragic, grieving for these bright and shining young men who fought on in the face of certain death. And here we touch on one of the core themes, not just of the Godothin, but of heroic poetry in countless other ancient traditions across the world. Life in the face of unavoidable death. There is honour and glory for sure, but from one perspective, that simply creates a contrast with the overwhelming sense of loss and grief. This meditation upon the warrior's death isn't the first thing that springs to mind when we think of the legendary Arthur, but the closer we look, we find that mortality and the mysteries of death are always just below the surface in the Welsh myth of Arthur. Another source for the Welsh myth of Arthur is Cilwch and Olwen, one of the earliest prose narratives to survive in Welsh literature, believed to have been composed around the 12th century. This tale gives us another glimpse of the Welsh Arthur, presenting him not as the polite king of later romances, but as a mythical hero king, deeply rooted in Celtic tradition. In Cilwch and Olwen, Arthur is a king of immense power and authority, leading a war band of superhuman warriors and having authority over various other Welsh kings. This Arthur doesn't rule from the fairy tale Camelot. His court is at Cellywig in Cornwall, and even though he and his men have many feasts at the fortress, there is as yet no mention of the Round Table either. The quests in Cilwch and Olwen are also far removed from the courtly quests of later Arthurian romances. Instead of searching for the Holy Grail, Arthur and his men embark on quests for the beards of giants, the tusks of monstrous boars, wolf cubs, magic cauldrons and the blood of witches. Throughout these adventures, Arthur plays a very active role. He personally leads his men into danger time and time again, this is a far cry from the more passive Arthur of later romances, who often remains at court while his knights do all the hard work. Cilwch and Olwen also contains several episodes that appear to echo an ancient mythology. For example, there are several otherworldly fortresses that appear to stand for a supernatural dimension rooted in pagan belief. Many of the quests also have mythic resonances, the hunting of the magical beasts in particular taking on a ritual quality. As we explore on the Native Tales course, there are intricate and profound mythic patterns woven throughout Cilwch and Olwen, suggesting a complex of belief and ritual that once surrounded this early Welsh Arthur. He appears to have been a mythic figure that oversaw what we might call the men's mysteries, the rites and ceremonies of the early Welsh nobility. On the Arthur of the Welsh course, we try to fill out this mythology and tease out its roots in the broader Indo-European tradition. Once again, we find that mortality and the mysteries of death are a major theme in Cilwch and Olwen. Some of the most important episodes focus on the deaths of giants in particular, many of whom appear to inhabit ancient fortresses. Here we may have echoes of ancient Celtic chieftains living in their Iron Age hill forts, each one succumbing to the superhuman warriors of Arthur's court. One way of understanding Cilwch and Olwen is to see it as a depiction of a new generation of early Welsh warriors killing off the older Brythonic aristocracy that had survived since the Iron Age. There is a sense of the young replacing the old and of Arthur as a symbol of renewal and new power. And he not only kills off the older generation of giants, but he also symbolically takes their power by stealing their magical items. Many of the quests undertaken by Arthur and his men are for objects and items that appear to contain a type of ancestral power. One of the more common treasures associated with the Welsh Arthur is the magic cauldron. 
There are several early Welsh sources that mention this ancient Celtic artefact, and in Cilwch and Olwen, Arthur and his men set out on a quest to retrieve the cauldron of Diwrnach Withel. In the Welsh story triads, a very similar cauldron is described. The cauldron of Darnuch the giant. If meat for a coward were put in it to boil, it would never boil. But if meat for a brave man were put in it, it would boil quickly, and that the brave could be distinguished from the cowardly. Several such cauldrons are found throughout the Welsh tradition, and Celtic scholars have long recognised these magical vessels as precursors to the Holy Grail, a symbol of Christian mysticism that came to dominate the later Arthurian legend. In the Welsh tradition, we find magical cauldrons with powers of abundance, inspiration and rebirth. One of the most famous is the cauldron of Anun, which appears in the early Welsh poem, The Spoils of Anun. The story we find in this old poem is actually quite similar to the episode in Cilwch and Olwen, but this time Arthur's quest for the magic cauldron leads him and his men to Anun, the Welsh otherworld. This cauldron of Anun appears to be quite similar to the one mentioned in Cilwch and Olwen and the Welsh triads, because in much the same way we're told that it will not boil a coward's food. But the cauldron of Anun appears to also be a cauldron of inspiration. One of Arthur's companions on his quest to the other world is the great mystical bard Taliesin who, elsewhere in Welsh myth, was said to have gained inspiration by drinking from a magic cauldron. The cauldron of Anun therefore appears to be not just a vessel that only feeds the brave, but one that can also confer supernatural inspiration. It may be easier to think of it as one symbolic cauldron with several different attributes. As we explore on the Taliesin Origins course, there is a clear connection between the magical inspiration Taliesin receives from the magic cauldron and his ability to transcend death, to reincarnate with the memories of his previous life still intact, what looks like a pagan variety of Christianity's eternal life. The Holy Grail of later Arthurian tradition likewise confers a type of spiritual inspiration, a divine enlightenment, and also an eternal life. But this time, through Christ's salvation, symbolised during communion by drinking from a sacred cup. In 1138, an Anglo-Norman cleric by the name of Geoffrey of Monmouth completed his first great work, Historia Regum Britanniae, the history of the kings of Britain, and it totally revolutionised the Arthurian tradition. Geoffrey probably wasn't Welsh, although he may have been of Breton descent. Either way, he was a member of the Anglo-Norman elite who had conquered England some generations earlier in 1066. Geoffrey took what little he knew of the Welsh Arthur and worked it into a fully-fledged pseudo-history. He presented Arthur as a great king who not only united Britain but also conquered much of Europe. Geoffrey's Arthur was an explicitly Christian king, a paragon of medieval kingship, quite distinct from the mythical hero king of the earlier Welsh myth. Geoffrey's reworked Arthur caught the imagination of his Anglo-Norman audience. It provided this powerful nobility with a grand mythical past and also legitimised their aspirations to rule over the whole of Britain. They wanted to see themselves as being the natural rulers of both the Anglo-Saxon latecomers and the native Welsh of Britain. From this point on, Arthurian legend began to evolve rapidly, absorbing elements of medieval romance and chivalric ideals. 
Following Geoffrey's reworking of the original Welsh material, Arthurian legend exploded across Europe. French poets like Chrétien de Troyes introduced elements like the Holy Grail and Lancelot's affair with Guinevere. German authors like Wolfram von Eschenbach further developed the Grail legend, while in England Thomas Mallory's Le Morte d'Arthur became the definitive English version. During this period, the mythic Arthur became a figure of Christian mysticism, heavily focused on the Holy Grail. But it was a mysticism he didn't take part in directly. That was left to his knights of the newly invented round table, who found themselves wandering strange lands in search of this magical artefact. These later tales transformed Arthur's court into the epitome of medieval chivalry. Knights embarked on quests not just for glory, but for spiritual enlightenment. The round table became a symbol of equality and fellowship among the warrior elite of medieval Europe. But Arthur himself became more of a figurehead, with individual knights like Lancelot, Gawain, Galahad and Percival taking centre stage in most of the stories. Despite the differences between the early Welsh Arthur and the later Galfridian and post-Galfridian versions, some fundamental themes appear to have been carried over from one period to the next. Perhaps the best example is the Holy Grail itself, what could in fact be an evolution of the ancient Celtic symbol of the magic cauldron. Medieval Christians believed that the Holy Grail was a mystical cup said to have been used by Jesus at the Last Supper. But the Grail itself doesn't appear in the Bible or in any other significant Christian writing. In fact, it appears to have its origins in a wondrous object dreamed up by the French poet Chrétien de Troyes. In his unfinished Arthurian tale, Percival, the story of the Grail, written around 1180, Chrétien describes it as a jewelled golden dish, quite different from the cup we often picture today. After Chrétien de Troyes, the Grail became an important symbol in Arthurian legend, with many European writers embellishing and developing this idea. Robert de Boron, writing around 1200, linked it directly to Christ's crucifixion, saying it was the cup that caught his blood. Later stories added more layers of symbolism and mysticism, and the Grail became a powerful metaphor for divine grace, spiritual enlightenment, and ultimately the search for eternal life. But why did it catch on so quickly? Well, Part of the Grail's appeal lay in how it combined Christian symbolism with the adventure and mystery of Arthurian legend. The Grail had some obvious precursors in Christian tradition, like the chalice of the Eucharist that holds Christ's blood, the wine of communion. But it also echoed older Celtic myths about magic cauldrons. Chrétien de Troyes would have been quite familiar with Celtic myth, and he may have picked up the idea from Welsh and Breton stories he knew about Arthur and his quests for magic cauldrons. Not only that, but the Grail quest is undertaken by brave knights, and only the purest and hardiest of these chivalrous warriors will be allowed to drink from it. Just like the Welsh cauldron that will not provide food for cowards. The quest for the Grail just like Arthur's raid on Anun or his quest for Diurnach's cauldron, also involves a journey into a mysterious otherworld, full of dangers and marvels, which only the best of men can survive. These themes of eternal life and transcendent knowledge can of course be understood as reactions to human mortality. Both the Grail and the cauldron are symbols of eternity, mystical objects that evoke the presence of supernatural powers in the realm of mortal nature, where death is as certain as the turning of the seasons. The warrior's quest can be understood as an attempt to overcome death itself, to be victorious over this greatest of foes, the final enemy all warriors inevitably face on the battlefield.
One of the most fascinating aspects of Arthurian legend is how it reflects the values and concerns of the societies that shaped it. The Welsh Arthur embodies the ideals of a Celtic warrior society, valuing strength, loyalty to one's warband and martial prowess. He also stands for the warrior's attempt to overcome death by venturing into the other world and engaging with supernatural powers. The later Galfridian and post-Galfridian Arthur also reflects the ideals of medieval European aristocracy. He's the perfect Christian king, upholding the chivalric code. His court becomes a stage for exploring ideas of courtly love, knightly virtue, and the tension between secular and spiritual pursuits. In this later setting, the Holy Grail appears to stand for many of the same mysteries contained in the Celtic magic cauldron. This transformation tells us a lot about the cultural changes that occurred in medieval Europe. As feudal society developed, with its emphasis on loyalty to one's lord and courtly behaviour, Arthurian legend adapted to explore and reinforce these values, but in an explicitly different religious setting, where the ancient pagan symbolism has been converted to Christianity. In this sense, part of Arthur's appeal was clearly his adaptability. Like all great myths, it could be reinterpreted for a new generation of the warrior elite and their quest for meaning in a brutal and dangerous world. In this, Arthur isn't just a relic of the past. He's a living embodiment that continues to evolve. Modern retellings continue to find new angles on these ancient tales. Some return to the Celtic roots, emphasising the mythological and magical elements. Others use the legend to explore contemporary issues of power and morality. What makes Arthurian myth so powerful is its ability to be both timeless and timely, with its deep roots in Celtic myth, making it a perennial source of ancient wisdom.